evening, participants, and welcome to AMRE Flying Doctors webinar session. Today, we are, we are fortunate uh, and privileged to have Dr. Kingi Mochache with us uh, to give us a talk on depression. Dr. Kingi Mochache is a leading uh, psychiatrist in Nairobi. Uh, she's uh, specialized in treating all sorts of mental conditions. She has a special interest in uh, child psychiatry, and uh, we look forward to having her with us today. Uh, a special welcome we'd like to extend to my, our Maisha members, the Tamra Flying Doctors, and all friends of uh, the Amre family. Welcome. Uh, we have uh, participants from across the globe. We have participants from Europe participants from the USA and participants from uh, the East African region. Uh, feel very welcome. And remember to post your questions on the Q&A under the, the, the Zoom button Q&A, uh, and we'll respond to your questions after the presentation by Dr. Kingi. Uh, so Dr. Kingi, uh, welcome. Uh, please go ahead. Uh, go ahead with your presentation, Karibu Sama. Good evening, everyone. Are you able to hear me, Lelo? Am I audible? Yes, all clear. Uh, go ahead. Okay, so as he, as uh, Dr. Lelo has introduced, my name is Dr. Kingi, and um, today I'm going to tell you more about uh, depression. Um, the depression that actually needs treatment. A lot of us just suffer in silence, not knowing that there is a name for what is going on and also not knowing that there is help and there, there, it's actually a documented medical condition that has scientific basis and that has evidence-based uh, treatment options. So I'll start by um, sharing my screen, just a minute. And uh, the presentation today is actually quite basic. It's for the way I made it is in a way that anybody can understand. You don't have to have any medical uh, background or a lot of research on matters of mental health. So by the end of this uh, talk, we should be able to understand what depression is. So define it. Um, have an idea about what the cause of depression is and the treatment options that are out there. I'll touch a bit about uh, various investigations that uh, a doctor may send you for and why they're important. And I'll also um, mention different types of self-help things that one can do to manage depression. So what is depression? First, I'll take you through the nine symptoms of depression, which are listed in the psychiatrist's uh, manual known as DSM-5. Um, these are cardinal symptoms, but it doesn't mean that um, each one of them has to be there or if another one, um, an extra symptom that was previously um, considered to refer to depression is there, it rules out the diagnosis. So. The first symptom is feeling down or dejected for most of the time. Now, this is a bit different from the normal sadness that one feels. Actually, the key statement here is feeling down or dejected most of the time. So most of the time throughout the day. Then there is also take, taking less interest is taking less interest in things that you were interested in before. So these two are actually cardinal features. One or the other has to be there beside the other um, seven. So both of them can be there or one must be there. You can't have the other seven and leave out these two. That will not classify, that will not qualify for um, depression. So taking less interest in things that interested you before includes like um, if you were someone who was very interested in your job, suddenly you're not. Hobbies, you liked golfing, suddenly you don't do it for a certain duration of time. Third is feeling tired or fatigued. 
So this includes not, you have to rule out medical reasons and also adequate um, rest for you to say that you're always feeling tired or fatigued. So commonly a patient will come in and say that um, I am sleeping enough, but still I'm just always tired or fatigued. In the morning, I can't, um, I, this is just a new symptom that, it, that was not there from before. Then they're sleeping too much or too little. Most people actually think that when one has depression, suffers depression, they have, they lose sleep. Not everybody loses sleep when they're depressed. Some people actually sleep more. They are always sleepy throughout the day. There are patients who, tell, who talk of sleeping 20 hours a day. That's back to like a baby. So they are always sleepy during the day. At night, they are sleeping. So they are sleeping all the time. Insomnia is also a feature of depression. And the specific type of insomnia is what we call terminal insomnia or the insomnia where you go to bed, fall asleep, but wake up earlier than you intended to and cannot go back to sleep. So most of the time when insomnia is initial, difficulty falling asleep, more often than not, it points towards more of um, anxiety, more than depression. But that's not to say that it's stuck in stone. Um, Uh, the fifth symptom is eating too much or too little. The, the main reason why I put the picture there is because the kind of eating that happens when one has major depressive disorder is geared more towards eating junk, so sweet things, um, uh, junk food, uh, carbohydrates. In fact, most uh, it's documented that one will feel like eating more of um, comfort food, what people call comfort food, like those mac macarons. Eh? And another group will eat too little. So you always have to make sure that when you're adding weight, it is not to say that I cannot be depressed. I'm eating too much. In fact, I'm adding weight. That's a sign that I'm happy. No, some people actually eat more when they're uh, depressed. A large majority will have um, poor appetite, struggle to eat completely. It doesn't matter what meal you present to them. And also there's a typical description of not enjoying food. So food doesn't look good anymore. If you're eating, you're eating because you need to survive. It's just a, a, a part of life that needs to happen. The sixth symptom is feeling indecisive or unable to concentrate. Um, Many times uh, we might think twice about most topics, but when you find even to choose what you want to wear in the morning, you're taking 10 minutes and previously you used to do it in one minute or less, or you cannot concentrate. People are talking to you. They're always telling you, oh, Kingi, you're not listening to me. Look at me. Or did you hear what I said? Or a good example usually is in the home where a parent is actually going through depression and Every time the child talks to them, it's like they've not heard. And the child keeps asking, mom, why aren't you listening to me? Or dad, why, why can't you hear what I've said? I've already told you. I told you five minutes ago what I was doing. Then you realize you're hardly concentrating. A good uh, way to gauge whether your concentration is good most of the time, like for older parent, older, the older generation, you'll ask them whether they're able to concentrate through watching something like news or they're able to read a newspaper, something that they would do before, or now they find that their mind is elsewhere, um, whether they're able to read um, maybe religious books. If uh, one used to read the Bible, can they read through a whole passage or you find that their mind cannot concentrate or keep attention to whatever um, they're doing. The seventh symptom of depression is feeling worthless, guilty, or self-critical. So actually a very typical description um, of depression, when a patient walks into my, into my office, they'll tend to be talking so much about something bad that they did and continuously um, focusing on it and feeling like they are like the worst person. When you 
engage with maybe past um, events or other things that they had done, you feel like they're judging themselves too harshly. They're too self-critical and they're unable completely to forgive themselves for the mistake they made. Sometimes it could be even something that is just part of life, like you forgot to do something and you forgot to maybe pick up uh, bread on your way home and you feel so guilty about something like that and it's endless. You're ruminating and continuously thinking about it. The eighth symptom of depression is thinking often of death or suicide, behaving su uh, in a suicidal manner or harming yourself. So I'll take a little uh, more time here because this is uh, quite uh, a big deal and it's actually very unfortunate because this is very final most of the time. I'll start with self-harm. Self-harm self -harm comes in many different ways. Uh, the common way for especially the younger generation, teen, uh, teenage age groups and women well up, up into their 20s is cutting themselves. Some people tend to think that this is something that was copied somewhere or the child wants to look cool or what, but actually the explanation is when you ask them, why are you cutting yourself or what is this? Most of them, first of all, will really try to hide it most of the time. So wear long sleeved sweaters and all this. And when you ask them, why are you cutting yourself? Deep down, they'll just explain that when it is depression, cutting um, self-harm may be due to many different reasons. Not all of them are due to depression, but when it is due to depression, the description will be like, this pain, the physical pain on my hand diverts the emotional pain, which is worse to bear. So they prefer to feel something on their hand. They'll actually say, I'm numb emotionally. So I'd rather cut myself to feel something, to feel that pain, because the emotional pain is described as completely worse than the pain of that cut. Secondly, behaving in a suicidal manner. This can come in all forms and shapes. Um, you can have uh, people who are having reckless sexual habits. They actually know that maybe there's a disease, but they are at that point where they don't care whether I die, whether I contract a, a, a terminal illness or whether I, whatever happens. There's also very subtle ways people behave that you can see this is very, um, when you talk to them, they'll actually explain that I am actually, I don't care if I die. Um, for example, driving, reckless driving. One is drunk or one is really driving in a very dangerous manner. And you can see this one is just driving themselves um, with an intention of if I die or I don't, it's fine. Um, finally, it's thinking often about death. So you don't have to want to act on the thoughts. But you can find that um, some patients will come and tell you that every, every day I'm thinking, every situation I'm in, I see how I'll die. Um, I could be crossing the road and I imagine that car has hit me. Or I could be getting into this lift and I imagine how it will stall and something will stab me. Or I'll look at a knife and imagine how that could just um, stab me. Or I could be walking here different ways where every situation just reminds them of death and they're always thinking about death. And finally, now there's the suicidal thoughts where you imagine or feel that you'd be better off death or you need, in Kiswahili, we say kuwaondo care. I need not to be here anymore. I'm tired. Um, suicidal acts, asking about suicide is very important um, for your loved ones, um, for all doctors who are maybe with a patient. It doesn't give the person the idea. A lot of people think that you shouldn't talk about suicide because it's a very, uh, it's a taboo topic or you'll be encouraging the person. But really most people who have had suicidal thoughts, when you ask about it, it's a relief that this can be discussed. Um, methods are said to be more lethal among men so this is jumping from heights or hanging. And for ladies, they use less, let me not use the word lethal, more extreme painful. For ladies, um, the more common methods are actually overdoses, 
So you'll find someone has already researched how much of a specific um, uh, chemical or medication will be able to kill me. Here in Kenya, the commonest, whether in private or public service, the most common substances are poisons, rat poisons, organophosphates, or um, I don't know where that notion came from, but people will always uh, run to the shop to buy some kind of pesticide, or I don't know why that is common here, but, and home medication. So medication that maybe is there for a chronic illness or painkillers, those are the common overdose we see. Um, the ninth and final symptom is feeling fidgety or unable to sit still or moving and speaking slower than normal. So this most of the time will be observed by someone else. Someone will just notice, ah, oh, Kingi, you're too restless. You're always on the edge. You're talking too much. So not all people who are depressed will keep quiet and go to a corner. Sometimes you'll actually see that they are fidgety, over involved, unable to sit still, talking too much. And another group, which is now the common what most people know, will isolate themselves, sp speak slowly. You can see when the way they are thinking, they are thinking slowly, answering you slowly, low volume. And they're almost ha having thought blocks. You can see they are not um, in their usual way. By the way, all these symptoms are compared to your premorbid state. So how you were before the symptoms began. Now, the other more important uh, item, actually for all those nine symptoms that I've listed, you could actually uh, say that uh, all these things are very gray, some days they are there, some days they are not, but actually to define it, it has to be there for more than two weeks, most of the day, or most of those days. Out of those two weeks, there are more days than none that you've experienced these symptoms. Um, and in a continuous period of two weeks or more. Commonly in my clinic, actually, I've realized most patients, by the time they come to the hospital, they've lived with them for long, six months, one year. They think it's normal. Oh, it was caused by COVID. There was a lockdown. There was a, all this, or there was grief. Someone died. And you find that now it becomes their lifestyle to a point they don't even see it as a problem. Now, um, this table is mainly meant to differentiate thoughts, feelings, and actions so that you're able to see how depression can present. I'd like us to focus on the last group, which is actions, because depression being a very gray thing, according to most, um, you know, it's not like malaria where you will do a test and it's positive or negative and you have your response there or a blood sugar where you will know this is the limit of normal and from here now it's diabetes. In depression, it's very difficult. We do symptom count. Actually, psychiatrists just do symptom count and severity in uh, that's those symptoms and their effect on the individual's functioning, which is what now I'm going to list in the actions here. So a good, for all my um, listeners, I'd like you to always ask yourself, have I stopped doing things that I used to enjoy? I know here in Kenya, we hardly have hobbies. Most of us, actually, our pastime is um, meet up with friends and maybe go to a club or go out partying. People forgot most of their hobbies. So ho by hobbies, I mean um, different things like uh, cookery, art, sports, if you used to do those things and suddenly you don't enjoy them anymore and you stopped, tick that as one of your red flags. Because if I start asking about whether you're feeling down and what, that's very gray. Secondly, do you spend less time with other people? So I know there's a whole category of people who call themselves introverts. There are people, by their social skills are different for everyone. There are people who like being around others and there are some who one or two people is enough. But when I say spend less time with other people, it means it's different from what your norm was. You used to come out and spend time in the living room with your family, but now you just lock yourself in the room with a laptop all day. 
or you find that all social events you have an excuse like for us doctors we are very good at that the excuse is um, i'm working i have patients i have patients so there's a wedding you don't go there's a, a birthday you don't go there's uh, whatever people are going up country you don't go. you'd rather just stay alone all the time if you really ask yourself the reason the reason is not work it's just that you don't want to mix with people and you used to mix with people the third one is eating more or less not than other people sorry that's a that's a typo than you used to so wait wait actually in uh, uh my clinic one of the biggest the easiest way to explain to a patient there's an issue is you just look at your weight changes in three months in six months, in a year. If you're losing weight and it was not in your plan, you were not dieting, you were not having some, you know, goals. It was not um, a planned activity on how to lose weight. There might be a problem. If you're putting on too much weight, that might also be a red flag. Then sleep. So these four you're sleeping too much, you're having trouble sleeping, these four will actually be so black and white for you to be able to tell you there might be a problem. Then after that, you go to uh, feelings. So as I said, feelings are neither here nor there for most people, especially here in Africa, people don't want to talk about I'm sad, I'm upset, or I'm tearful. It's other people who will notice, huh, she's not the way she used to be. Being restless and agitated, that can actually come from others. Um, feeling empty and numb. This is actually an extreme of sadness. Being tired and having no inner energy, inability to concentrate is repetition. Being indecisive, desperate and suicidal, lonely and cutting off from others. That's how you're feeling. So being alone and feeling lonely are two different things. There are people who are alone and happy and they just chose to be like that. But feeling lonely, that's an issue or cutting off people. You don't want anybody around you. Then now you go to your thoughts. What consists of most of your thoughts? Do you keep dwelling on your past mistakes or failures based on whatever moral compass you're using? Do you keep criticizing yourself? Like I, I was five minutes late, I should have been there on time or thinking things that thinking that life doesn't matter now. Life has no meaning, what's the point? Um, there's never going to be a better day. Actually, there's a book, a good book by an author known as Matt Haig, who describes his own experience of depression, where he says he suffered depression maybe around in his 20s. And by the time he's writing this book, it's well into his 30s, and now he's around 40. And he'll describe how at that time he imagined things were never going to get better. He was never going to enjoy food. Um, it's a, mo a way of thinking that just keeps the depression going continuously. And you even think of ending your life, you know, to just make this suffering stop immediately. Another thing to prove to you, is it really depression? Your social functioning. So are you able to um, function as a mother? whatever you are uh, socially, are you able to function as a wife, as a husband? Do you meet your friends? Are you an uncle? I don't know, uh, whatever role you are socially, are you still able to function? Or now that there's depression, you find that you changed and you just lock yourself up. Even as a grandparent, are you able to um, play with your grandchildren? Or would you rather just lock yourself somewhere in a room? Um, and also, are you able to function occupationally or academic? So for the younger people, actually the best feature. So there's the individual functioning, which someone can deny and decide not to look at. There's the social functioning, which people may complain about, and you may still think is not a problem. But now when there's a problem with occupational functioning or academic, most of the time that one is a very big red flag. So you find one uh, for people, adults, people who are working, you find that you're less productive. If you're in a business, you're less enthusiastic about it. So you're not really going about it uh, well. And you know, it becomes like a chicken and egg kind of situation whereby the less functioning you are, the more money you lose and the more 
depressed you get. So it becomes like a vicious cycle. Academic functioning, most teenagers or most uh, students will come with declining grades when depression um, starts. So most of the time, the age of onset of depression is around form two for a large, in fact, most mental illnesses begin around the age of between 14 and 25. So around form two is when you start finding people are experimenting on other things, substances and all that. But most of the time it's to try and cover a mood disorder like depression coming in and declining grades. And now you think that it's the substance that caused the declining grades or it becomes a mix up of things all together. But a good feature to know that now this child might have depression is declining grades in someone who was previously functioning okay. So the biggest question most of the time after I finish asking all the, um, the questions, usually we do an assessment that includes a lot of questions. And I tell my patients, okay, I think we have a major depressive disorder. And these are the reasons, these are the symptoms, this is the duration. This is the treatment plan and this is uh, the way forward. This is how long you should be on this. Most of the time, the, first, the next question will be, why, is, why am I depressed and everything is okay? In culturally, we are, meant, we are made to focus mainly on the environmental or stressful life events as a cause of depression. And this is not actually very correct. It's true, bereavement, can set off depression. Um, within the last year, a lot of people have um, lost loved ones. It's been continuous. So I get, I am almost 100% sure most of the participants here within the last two years have lost someone who's close to them. But you'll find one person has lost someone who's very close. And another one has lost someone who's far, who's not that attached to them. but one, the one who's very close seems to have overcome the loss somehow in a healthy way, whereas the other one seems to linger so much on it. So what causes that difference? It could be many factors, but not all depression is due to um, the environmental or stressful life events. End of a relationship, whether it was a marriage, whether it was just a, a friendship, a relationship, that can trigger a, de uh, a depressive episode. Losing a job or income, this was very common between 20 last year and this year with the pandemic and with our Kenyan economy. Um, transitions, so sometimes when you move homes, move countries, there's a new baby, there's a new life that may trigger depression. Physical illness, tough diagnosis, chronic illnesses, diabetes, all those could trigger depression. Loneliness, you find that people are all alone and they're feeling alone and they don't want to be alone. Traumatic or other stressful life events, all those are triggers. But now these other two um, list rows, biological and psychological are what we center more on as psychiatrists. Um, the biological part, it's very important. In fact, most of the time when a patient comes into my clinic and I ask them, is there anybody in, the, in your family who has um, a mental illness? The first question is no, I've never seen any. I'm yet to see any family without real <laughs> a mental illness. That's just the truth. The only difference is because we're not in Europe, we're not in the UK with NHS and all this, it goes undiagnosed. So some people will think it's because of this, this, he behaves different. All those strange beliefs, like uh, it was some kind of witchcraft or the, uh, he or she got too much into some religion or some cult or so-and-so looked at them, I don't know how, or it's because they were left. There's always a reason, but you'll never call it depression. Yet, genetic predisposition is the best way for you to protect yourself or know where when to seek help before it gets too far when you when you um, look at um, most of the time i say you cannot do anything about your genes but 
knowing and accepting them is very important on what you do next. Another biological um, uh, reason or cause of depression that you can't do much about is hormonal changes. So you'll realize that most mood disorders come about during um, the adolescent period and menopausal period. So the periods where hormones are all over the place and also postpartum after delivery. Any form of hormonal changes predisposes you to um, depression. Now, the second row, which is the psychological part, is ways of thinking, thinking patterns. Different people have different thinking patterns, but there are some thinking patterns that just predispose one to depression. And sometimes they start somewhere around um, in your teens, like negative views. They are, they are, you'll realize that there are a lot of um, what we call motivational speakers actually base most of their, their talks on this row, the psychological thinking patterns, because all these positive affirmations, um, looking at the positive side of life, uh, not catastrophizing everything, not blaming yourself for everything, all that, if I am the kind of person who, if things don't go this way, they go this way, I hit the roof. I'm more predisposed towards getting depressed because I'll keep getting disappointed over and over. And if I cannot master the way to change my thinking pattern, because life will have all these stressful events happening, but how I view them is what is protective to me or to anyone who uh, may suffer depression. So what keeps depression going? It's mainly the thinking patterns. The first one, what do you do when you feel unmotivated? So everybody will have a bad day or a good day, but let's say you have the full two weeks of de depressive symptoms. What do you do after that? If you seek help, depression will not keep going. If you sit in the house and keep worrying and ruminating and thinking and refusing, chances are the depression will just keep going. What do you do when things go wrong? Like when you have no energy, let me use an example of when you have no energy. One of the methods of treating depression is what you call behavior activation. You will notice that if you stay, if you start a day badly, the rest of the day is likely to be dull. So if you wake up and you have no energy, then you decide, ah, let me just stay in bed. Chances are you keep feeling low, but if, you force yourself out of the house to go and do something that will make you feel like you've achieved something. Chances are the depression symptoms might start um, reducing. Um, then we have um, unhelpful, unhelpful thinking habits, which are what I had uh, already um, alluded to. Rumination actually just means um, being in your hole of worry and sadness. Like you just decide you're going to start thinking about how bad things are. And it's like a hole, you know, it's like a cycle. You just keep going deeper and deeper and deeper. So usually we advise, don't ignore your problems, but set a time. We call worry time. When you tell yourself, I'm going to worry about for 30 minutes and see and use my problem solving skills to try and solve whatever is um is worrying me then also um your past your beliefs and your assumptions can keep depression going one of the biggest uh, triggers or one of the biggest predispositions to depression is actually adverse childhood experiences so if one had um, abuse as a child whether it's psychological physical sexual abuse um, whether one really suffered as a child whatever happened, death of um, a mother before 11, all those predispose you to depression later in life. And as I said, much as I'm mentioning all these things as triggers, what cannot be changed remains there. We're supposed to try our best to move forward, accept that this happened, but now try and look for um, a way forward. Mm. Now, treatments for depression, we'll start with the psychological. Actually, there are um, 
classified into three. The first uh, treatment for depression is getting out the bad environment. I'll give you an example. Uh, normal, uh, that's not in this slide, but normal behaviors like bad sleeping patterns that could actually um, need correction before we move on on how we're going to treat depression. Um, bad, uh, poor eating habits or substances, substances like alcohol. Taking alcohol predisposes one to depression. It makes you happy for a few minutes, but it's actually a brain depressant. So you end up um, with depression after six hours. Most people should, um, I always say, try, try and see. You'll be happy for that two hours but six hours after the drink, you'll find that you're sadder than you were before. So for people who take alcohol to try and cover up their problems, that's what usually happens. And in fact, it even increases your risk of suicidal thoughts. So the first one is, um, I've mentioned sleep, um, what you take in, so diet and alcohol. And finally, physical activity, whether you sit in the house the whole day or do some kind of physical activity, those need to be corrected. Then there's the environmental factors. If let's say you're in an abusive um, environment, you're maybe um, in a marriage and there's a lot of battering or emotional abuse, that also needs to be removed. Before now, we can talk about the treatments forward. Now, the ones that are medical. This include psychological treatment. So this is talk therapy. Uh, the method that is most preferred is actually uh, cognitive behavior therapy. So most people are confused about what therapy is. You expect to walk into some office with a couch and lie down there and talk about your whole life. But actually cognitive behavior therapy is quite structured and it can pinpoint this is the problem, this is the solution, this is how we're going to, it's very structured on, um, adjusting behavior modifications and also um, cognitive thinking errors. It works on thinking errors. This problem solving therapy, acceptance and commitment therapy, and then behavior activation, which I had mentioned earlier. So we have the psychological methods and then we have medication. Most people are very, very averse to medication. I am aware of this. Other than sleeping pills, someone will come and tell me, okay, I just want something to help me with sleep. But most of the medication, why treat the sleep? It's like treating fever and you leave out the malaria. You're better off just taking the correct treatment for whatever diagnosis we have made. If it is depression, we have different classes of drugs, which I will not get into, but the common ones are like select SSRIs, uh, for example, Prozac. Prozac is quite common in the movies and everywhere. Um, this one is taken in the morning and it, it is a, not a sleeping pill. It is not addictive. Another class that's quite common is what you call the tricyclic antidepressants, TCAs. These ones are more common because they are older types of medication, but there is one like amitriptyline, which is quite common because it is affordable um, and it also helps with sleep. Antidepressants are so many. In fact, I picked this particular slide to tell you that there are over, I don't know, 20 antidepressants out there in the market. And each antidepressant is picked by a psychiatrist depending on your presenting symptoms, your risk factors, things like your comorbidities, whether you're on other medication, um, whether I need to correct maybe your sleep and appetite first, whether having too much sleep is a problem for you, whether um, adding more weight will be a risk for you and so on, whether you have heart problems and so on. So there are different antidepressants and they're geared, they work differently. If you're a child, there are those ones that are more, that are um, acceptable, have been researched among the, the uh, people below 18 years and so on. So antidepressants are not a pill that you can just go over the counter and decide I need to pop that happy pill and continue. And antidepressants are not addictive. They're not uh, benzodiazepines. It's true you'll need them to be um, increased in a certain way and reduced. You don't just wake up and stop. And for the effect to take place, it takes about two to four weeks for you to start feeling better. 
but antidepressants actually really work for um it's proven in research it's proven in practice um, another method that I left out of here is something we call ECT, so that's shock therapy. Very controversial, people will always um, be afraid of it, but it, it really works and it works quickly and it is um, research-based. But not everybody qualifies to go. There are, specific, there, are, there are specific indications on when one will benefit from ECT, electroconvulsive therapy. Now, what if you just leave depression untreated? It's true, some people just get out of it without knowing, you know, out of self-help and uh, different methods, uh, behavior modification, you know, you start exercising and you're more particular and careful with your lifestyle, especially for mild to moderate depression, that might work. But at what expense? Most of the time, there'll be a lot of work days lost, academic challenges, social problems all together. You may not be functioning. Um, worst case scenario is suicide or homicide or substance use, especially among men. It's very difficult for men. I know I'm an African, so I am in this country and I'm in this region of the world, it's very difficult for men to show up and discuss feelings or emotions or uh, problems. So most men will either suffer in silence, in fact, they have the higher rate of uh, completed suicide, whereas women have a very high rate of attempts. Or they'll end up using a certain substance to try and cover up their symptoms. So that's where you end, you, you end up finding um, a lot of alcohol use that is not, that is problematic. It's usually some kind of self-medication. It could be alcohol, it could be cannabis, it could be anything, any other drug that one is using to just try and cover up the symptoms of depression, but most of the time it ends up being a vicious cycle. Um, I think I'll end there and I'll take questions. I may not have covered everything, but um, yes. Lelo. Thank you very much, Dr. Kingi, for your wonderful presentation. We have learned a lot. I think uh, quite an eye-opening uh, discussion you've had. I think many of us have recognized uh, that there might be some amongst us who need a lot of help and uh, actually need to, to seek services from a psychiatrist for them to get assisted with this matter. Uh, there are a few questions on the on the chat. I think we can. Uh, I, I'll start with mine. What what uh, are there any natural remedies for for depression? We, we see a lot of people taking uh, Saint John's Wort and other echinacea roots. You know, a lot of uh, herbal, herbal solutions for for depressive uh, conditions. Do you, are they do they work? What's your opinion on them? Okay, like Saint John's Wort was actually in our pharmacology book. So yes, it evidence based showed that it works. Now my challenges with most herbs, I don't want to talk about herbal medication and alternative medication uh, because I'm not a specialist in that. And from all my reading, I'm not so sure whether any of them um, really work. But my challenge with most herbal treatments is how do you quantify the side effects? Are they documented? Um, maybe it should be on follow up with that alternative doctor because now what effects that it, does it have in the, on the liver? What effects does it have on, the, uh, on your kidneys? What is the duration of treatment and so on? I know things like chamomile might help for sleep. That's harmless. But as a full-blown treatment for depression, um, I'm not so sure about the herbal remedies. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, interesting question here. What, was there depression in the traditional Af African settings? 
what did they have any remedies or people just suffered in silence or what 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 have you found in your reading about the traditional african society and depression or even broadly what was happening in mental illness so in the, in basically <laughs> um that's uh, an interesting question the teaching is of course you know now this is in retrospect um research shows that mental illness has always been there it's just that it's more recognized now it has a name in traditional africa let me talk of africa um most of it was treated by you know that actually like there are forms of psychotherapy people do like your grandmother will talk to so and so hindu in amsomboa and that will kind of work for the mild and moderate depression or um our habits our habits um in traditional our grandparents habits they would not sleep during the day you know they had very good sleep hygiene they had three meals they uh, were physically active so all those things seemed to have kind of protected but most mental illness was actually just thought of as witchcraft or a familial thing like your familia or kohivi yet it's just the genetics don't marry from there they usually kill themselves you know those kind of things it is um it was there but it was not treated and it was never spoken about so you find that other generations do not even know about it Hello, Lelo. Ah, sorry Origin. about. Mm -hmm. Sorry about that. I, I was asking about uh, what is the link between depression and high blood pressure. What is the link between uh, depression and uh, you know ulcers? Do the ulcers come first and then you get depressed, or do you get depressed and then you get ulcers? Maybe you can talk to us about the the diseases of the body and whether they are related to the diseases of, of the mind. Okay, there's something I didn't mention, um, especially for children, um, depressive symptoms come out with physical symptoms. So you'll find stomach aches, headaches, and so on. Um, but ulcers, let it just remain as ulcers among the gastroenterologist specialists. But these are high um, correlation with what we call functional abdominal symptoms with different mental um, illnesses, especially depression and anxiety. So you find that uh, most of the time when one has either depression or, or anxiety, they have flare ups of those functional abdominal symptoms, things like heartburn or the ulcers, or actually depression even affects your immunity. So you keep having frequent colds and the, the connection is a hormone called cortisol, stress hormone, which links different parts of the body. So you find that even something like a, an MI, a heart attack, may be related to a depressive or anxiety um, episode. But let us separate the two. You can't say um, unanipea pressure, you know, you're giving me hypertension. Hypertension is a disease on its own, and it is not always directly linked to depression or anxiety. Not always. There's a link in lifestyle and all that that could cause your blood pressure to go up or a panic situation where your all your vital signs, you know, your pulse races and everything. But hypertension is hypertension, get it treated and depression is depression. The only link is now circular. Let, let's not um, say that it's the sadness that's giving me pressure. No, as it's colloquially used in the streets. Thank you, thank you very much for that. A uh, lot of questions about uh, teenagers and uh, children uh, with depression. Maybe, maybe you can speak to that. There's one person who says, uh, he had a son who refused to go to boarding. You know, uh, when he was forced to go, he wrote a suicide note, so the parent had to, to comply. So I think the query is, how, how do parents know their children are depressed? There are children who will say, I am feeling depressed. Are they just uh, faking it? 
how how can a parent uh, be more attuned to their child's uh, mental state? Should they be seeking a psychologist or a psychiatrist? Maybe you can you can advise uh, the parents of teenagers in that respect on depression, suicidal ideation, suicidal uh, mentioned. What? How? How do the parents deal with their teenagers who are ex exhibiting such symptoms? Okay, so first I'll start by saying that the younger people are more aware of their mental health and they have more more interest in taking care of it head on. So sometimes when a teenager says I'm depressed, they actually know what they're talking about or I'm sad because in that in that generation, mental health is not stigmatized. Now, having said that, um, it's very difficult, even, af even for us as psychiatrists, to be able to tell whether a suicidal note or a suicidal threat is just a threat or the person is actually serious. So we always say, take every suicidal threat as real until proven later, because the outcome can be, it's, it's extreme, it's tra tragic. You're better off um, complying and then taking them for assessment, listening to them, getting to talk before you know whether this is just a manipulative move or someone is genuinely unwell. So other than when a child insists on being in a day school, Sometimes there's a reason you have to either take them to a counselor or talk to them and try to understand what is it about that boarding that is too difficult or that is making them. Because as I said, environmental stressors, you can be in an environment that you're totally unable to cope with and it will just um, present itself as full depression. In such a case, it's easier to just get the child out of that environment. After talking to them and after understanding exactly what the problem is, parenting is hard. Parenting, especially teenagers is hard. Just remember your own teenagehood normally, and then listen to the child. If you listen to the child, you might be able to get more of the answers and know what to do next. If they tell you they need to see a therapist, just take them to a counselor. Someone here asked about um, the grassroots. Like here in Nairobi, we have um, uh, county health centers where you can actually get help. It doesn't have to be at a psychiatrist. I know we are only 100 in this whole Kenya. You can actually get a counselor, a properly trained counselor who can be able to escalate or help or give advice based on their assessment. Thank you. I think there's a, a lot of... Uh queries regarding to how would uh, a person approach a relative? How, how do we get a relative to seek help if they're having these uh, signs of depression? And uh, one has tried and says the person became verbally aggressive. How, how would uh, a, a person approach a family member to get them to, to seek help for depression? So unfortunately for mental health issues, Sometimes it's the people around you who will know you're unwell. I always say this, if King is unwell, it is my family that will tell me there's something wrong with me. Even if I'm a psychiatrist, it is the people around me who will say, eh, uh -uh. the way you're sleeping, the way you're talking, there's something off, the way you're behaving, the way you look, there's something called insight. When one is depressed most of the time, or when one, depression at least, most of our mental, illnesses, especially the ones with psychotic features, someone will not know that they are unwell because it's the, that same mind that is unwell. Now, it depends on in uh, the Kenya, the Mental Health Act actually allows a next of kin to take someone who is in danger of themselves danger of um, harming themselves, harming others, or continuously not functioning without their consent for treatment. So that is actually in the Mental Health Act. There are forms you will sign before you decide that because it's a very um, you know, slippery topic with um, just generally. But 
you there's you try first of all talking motivational interviewing slowly you talk to the person when you realize that you're not getting anywhere the mental health act allows you to forcefully take someone for treatment you're the one who and you give the doctor the reasons the doctor will decide this no she's fine there's no mental illness there this yes she needs this with tranquilization and their methods that are used Thank you. I think it, it's very important to point out that uh, there is a mental health act in Kenya, which was revised the other year. So it is something that uh, we should familiarize ourselves with. I think it gives a lot of rights to the patient, but also gives a lot of uh, powers to the person taking care of the patient and the doctor as well to be able to intervene, to bring care to this uh, person. Uh, another question here, a very good one. It's asking about what, what are the side effects of uh, antidepressive medications commonly? So different medications have different side effects. Um, the common one, which I always have to tell patients very importantly, like for the SSRIs, like fluoxetin, is that some of the symptoms seem to get worse within the first week, the first two weeks. Um, so if there was agitation and so on, those symptoms seem to get worse before they start getting better. Come on, most of that category, SSRIs, they have almost no side effects. It's like Panadol. So when you read um, the literature is when they'll tell you about um, nausea, headache, um, dry mouth, and so on. Now, the other drugs like amitriptyline or uh, mitazapine, the other groups of drugs, some of them have a lot of sleep. So if one was very, um, very sleep deprived, they'll have so much sleep like the first three days, but most of these side effects within two to four weeks all wear off. Remember, there's no addiction with proper antidepressants. I'm not talking about benzodiazepines, antidepressants are not addictive. And just to add on, life continues as normal. You'll be able to go to work. You'll be able to um, function once we get the correct dose and you acclimatize on an antidepressant. So it doesn't mean that now one has to become a zombie or not be able to do their things just because they're on um, antidepressants. Thank you, Dr. Kingi. Um, another question, a uh, very interesting one. Is, is uh, the talk therapy, the psychotherapy on its own adequate to treat a patient with depression or the, must, uh, the psychotherapy, the talk therapy must be accompanied by the antidepressive medications? Um, depression is classified into mild, moderate, and severe. For the mild and moderate um, categories, there's a way we do it as psychiatrists. Um, talk therapy alone can work without medication. But usually if you go to a good therapist, a good counselor, a good clinical psychologist, they'll refer you when they feel that it's not helping. Because when it's severe, most of the time, you need medication because your neurotransmitters are down, your brain chemicals are disrupted. So no amount of talk therapy will be able to correct that. But for Thank mild you. and moderate, it works. Thanks. Uh, what, what is the link between stress and depression? There's a lot of uh, talk about stress at the workplace, burnout. Is there, is there a, a strong link with depression or does the is it a, a, a mixture of people uh, confusing two separate issues or, or they go hand in hand? So according to our classifications, I know people don't like labels, but the main reason why psychiatrists have labels is to know the next plan of management. Um, we have a classification of stress and related disorders. So that usually means an acute thing that has happened like a stressor has occurred and has, you've developed maybe like an acute stress reaction or trauma, post-traumatic stress disorder and so on. So in psychiatry world, stress is classified under that. 
So very drastic things like, um, um, I don't know, um, um, attacks, terrorist attacks, those kind of things. Then, or something shocking that has happened to someone, you know, those are very individualized. Um, you could lose your job, then you get an acute stress reaction. Then there's depression, which is under mood disorders. Then there's anxiety. Now, most of the time when we are talking about stress, it's a mix, um, you know, socially, not in, the, in a clinic. Eh? Socially, I'm stressed. It could mean you're worked up, you're burnt out. So burnt out, the, burn, burn out, the treatment definitely is taking a break, taking a rest. And it's important for everyone to do that at some point. Um, they're talking about burnout. They're talking about an acute reaction of something. But there's sometimes also a mix of proper depressive features or anxiety. In fact, commonly anxiety, I'm afraid. You know, like right now we are all waiting for elections. We are soon going to be very anxious about everything that is happening and tense. So stress is used in a very particular way in our clinical setups. You can't mix them all, jumble them all together. Uh, in interesting question here on uh, whether depression by itself can cause death or it is uh, only by suicide. Can uh, severe depression lead to death on its own as an illness? <laughs> um, that's interesting because now working in the clinical world, I've seen patients who are terminally ill, maybe with something else, um, cancer or something, and uh, they get into depression and totally refuse treatment. You could say depression kills them, not really the cancer. Um, very severe depression, endogenous depression, can make one not eat continuously for a prolonged period of time or be sedentary. So someone just lies in bed all day, they get medical complications, you know, things like um, maybe thrombi. Um, and so on. But depression itself, I, I don't think so. It's, you'd say that the actions you took were suicidal, like not eating or not getting out of bed or not taking medication, not taking ARVs, you know, but not directly, like depression just killed you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Kingi. It looks like we're out of time. Uh, I'd like to welcome again uh, friends of AMREF Flying Doctors, uh, Maisha members who may have joined us late. Uh, we've had a very great session with Dr. Kingi. Uh, special thank you to Jane Mudoni and Dixon at the AMREF offices. And uh, I think we look forward to more webinars with you. Uh, we cannot say Big thank you enough to you, Dr. Kingi. I think everybody is looking forward to a part two of uh, this uh, series. I think we can tackle uh, the bigger topic that everyone doesn't like to discuss, and that is suicide. So stay tuned, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we will be in touch. And uh, this session has been recorded, and uh, the transcript uh, will be shared with you to those who submitted the correct emails at the point of registration. So thank you very much. Uh, have a good evening and see you again next time. Kwaheri, good night. Bye-bye.